Hi, Yoni. We can see you, Benoit. I don't see me. You I don't see you? No. It's okay. You 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 know you. It's uh, okay. it's all right. All right, everybody. So well, uh, I'll start. I'll start slow. So for those coming in, um, you could kind of uh, catch up. Um, this is first time people are probably still chasing uh, the Zoom links. So welcome to the mathematical engineering of deep learning. Uh, we have here uh, Benoit Liquet in Macquarie. Uh, Benoit, can you wave? So everybody, that's Benoit. And Hi. Shart Muka. Hey. And um, in, at UQ, Shart will actually be in Macquarie in about a month or two. Um, and uh, then myself in UQ as well. So. Uh, as you might have heard for, for Shart, I mean, it's kind of exciting. We're finishing our three-day lockdown now. We had a blitz lockdown in, in Brisbane, uh, just a precautionary measure, really. Um, so what you should see here, you see the browser on my iPad. Um, and I'll speak briefly about the course. We'll get kind of general course information. Um, I assume all of you have seen this page in this collection of pages. It's in deeplearningmath.org. Uh, and this is a page called the AMC Summer School page. Um, so these are evolving notes designed for this course, but they will also live after the course. Um, and uh, this specific page has a whole bunch of course information. So um, yeah, just to be clear, so we, we the three of us are, are lecturing and co-lecturing. Um, and at first, maybe we just introduce um, ourselves. So I'll, I'll start. I'll start with me, maybe. Uh, so I'm an associate professor at the University of Queensland. I'm Israeli originally. I've been in uh, Australia for about a decade. Um, I kind of like it. It's pretty good. Um, I work in a field called applied probability in general, uh, which is investigation of stochastic models uh, and their properties. Uh, but I'm, I'm also an, an amateur uh, machine learner, uh, hopefully amateurish enough to, uh, to teach you a thing or two in the course. And um, off to uh, Chart and Benoit, we're actually uh, good friends, uh, the three of us. Uh, so Benoit, um, tell us something. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Benoit Liquet. I'm professor in statistics. I'm in Macquarie University now. Uh, so you, I'm sure you have guessed with my strong accent, but I'm French. Uh, I arrived in UQ at, in 2012. I uh, was like, uh, lecturing in the same school as Yomi, or I met Yomi, who have a long uh, collaboration. Uh, my field of research is more to develop new uh, statistical methods, machine learning, for tackle uh, some high dimensional uh, data set in different application in biostat, uh, in medical, but also in environmental science. And uh, I'm very excited by this course and I'm uh, more uh, R person. So I will use uh, mostly R when we do some practical, but the uni will explain all of this when you will split uh, the, the students in three groups. So, and uh, we, we, you received uh, yesterday some uh, information for setting uh, some uh, R packages for the first uh, practical, which is uh, the first practical is already tomorrow. So, um, yep, that is. Thanks, Benoit. Uh, and it just must be mentioned also that uh, Benoit is a very strong uh, addict uh, to uh, dopamine generated from sports. Uh, he's a uh, He's a triathlete, uh, multi-time Ironman and under 10 hour Ironman, but don't worry about that too much. And Sharat, yes. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sharat. I'm a postdoctorate currently in uh, University of Queensland. Um, I mainly work on applied probability at a broader scale and with main focus on something called spatial point processes. Um, well, uh, apart from that, for this course, uh, I'll be using Python as a language, but you should not be having any difficulty uh, following the lectures if you don't know Python, because uh, uh, as you uh, seen lecture notes already, um, this language are mainly used to demonstrate uh, some examples. So you should not have any difficulty and what else we have? Uh, yeah, uh, career-wise, I will be in 
you know uh, macquarie university soon with bhinwa uh, yes. will be for you know another 5 years i guess as a research fellow yeah that's it you know All right, thanks, Shard. Uh, yeah, and we we work together quite a lot, uh, and are good friends. So, um, as as Ben Wan Shard mentioned, uh, in terms of of computing, um, we we are basically splitting it up into uh, into three. You've got the uh, R uh, practical, which will be Benoit BL. So whenever you see something BL in the practicals, etc., that means R. If you have questions uh, having to do with R, then uh, direct them to Benoit Lique. Uh, we have Python, which is uh, Sharat Moka SM, and we have the Julia. So if you choose to use it uh, to use a Julia language, then uh, that will be uh, me, uh, Yoni Nazarathi. Okay. Uh, however, the, but by the way, what you're seeing here is a snapshot of the web page on a software called Notability, so I can scratch on it. So this is basically the web pages of a few minutes ago. Uh, however, the the focus of the course is mathematical, so it's a mathematical engineering of deep learning. Uh, so you you have quite a few courses that uh, that teach deep learning for non mathematicians because it's actually very attractive. You don't need to know a whole lot of mathematics to to do effective stuff with deep learning. Uh, so you've got great stuff on Coursera, you've got fast AI, you've got deep learning AI, you've got, and we even link to these things and they're, and they're useful. Uh, but in this course, we, we chose, of course, to capitalize on the fact that you guys are, are uh, advanced undergraduate students or honor students or PhD students and uh, to give a bit more of a mathematical focus. Uh, having said that, this is not one of those theoretical courses of how deep learning works uh, and why it works and cutting edge theory explaining why it works. And people are actually still working on that. Uh, but it's more of a, of a hands-on mathematical engineering course. So that's pretty much the name, the mathematical engineering. Okay, so the software, even though it's central in the sense that we have to use it, uh, it's not central in the sense that we're not teaching in a software centric manner, but rather trying to just teach the content and, and use the software as we come along. And for that, you have the, the three of us. Now, in terms of schedule, uh, I assume most of you have seen this, but let's, let's just make sure it's clear because this, this table here is a, is a key table for the schedule. Uh, so all times, by the way, here, these are times that are, are in, uh, you know, Australia, AEDT in Sydney, Melbourne, Tasmania, etc. cetera. Uh, others like me and Sharat and many of you will have to make the adjustments. Okay, so these are the times. Uh, and we've got 28 hours in the course. Okay, so the course is 28 hours. And we, we work quite hard to see how to, how to fit these 28 hours in the course and, uh, and what, what to do. Um, so as you go sequentially, uh, you have week one up to week four, week one, two, three, four. You'll see that that's the second column and you have your days and time. If anybody sees some, some mistake that we've made where this doesn't align with the AMC summer school schedule, please let us know. Uh, I hope there isn't a mistake, but it should be okay. And then you've got um, a description of what unit we're covering and who is uh, running the lecture. So I'm, for example, responsible for unit one, uh, and that's the lecture. It's only that in the third hour, we don't have a lecture, but we rather have a split practical, okay? So in the sp split practical, you'll use one of the three alternative Zoom links. You have four Zoom links, right? So you either use a Zoom link for Benoit R, Sarat Python, or myself, Julia, and you'll go to these Zoom links, and uh, then you'll have the first practical. So we only have three practicals in the course. There's a practical for unit four and there's a practical for unit five, okay? These are kind of, and, and in these practicals, you'll actually need to have, or the best way to get the best out of the practical is to actually have a running version of R, Python, or Julia, and to have the source code that's accessible through those links, which you, you can click. This, this is a hyperlink, this is a hyperlink, this is a hyperlink, and this is also a hyperlink for the R source code, okay? You can get those hyperlinks and try to maybe get this going just a bit before to install the relevant packages, et cetera, so that when you arrive tomorrow in the afternoon for the split, split practical, then you can actually try things uh, live. So there'll be a few, a few tasks, okay? So that's, that's how we're working. Now, every week has a consultation hour from each of us, and you just have the times here, okay? Um, 
my suggestion is if you have any technical questions, uh, try to appear in the consultation hours. We should all be able to answer all questions that are language agnostic. Uh, but if you have questions that are language specific, then uh, clearly each person will answer best on, on the specific language according to the specification, which I said, right? So we will try not, we, we, it's hard to answer technical questions via email. Uh, but do use the Canvas discussion forum to uh, pose questions and answer to each other, etc. But also use our consultation hours. Okay, so that's that. Um, in terms of assessment, so you've got here the assessment. I'll actually go down to the assessment page and then we'll see it on the schedule. Um, so this is one of those courses, and of course, about half of you are doing the course for um, for assessment. This is a third summer school I've, I've been teaching. Uh, and it's often half the class does the course for, uh, for credit uh, and the other does not. Those that do not do it for credit often choose, and I, I suggest you do that, to still take part and do the assessment, but you really have to be disciplined with yourself and, and push yourself to do that. Um, so about the, the credit, you see here the percentage breakup out of the total grade. Uh, this 0%, I hope you've all looked at the diagnostic quiz and even tried to do it. And um, also please take a look at the solution because it's actually the description we have there about least squares and other things will be pretty good for warm up. All right. So the way this course works is there's no final uh, exam. And there are only uh, three quizzes. Okay. And the quizzes are, are, are short quizzes on the three consecutive Saturdays. Not, not this Saturday, but the Saturday that follows. Okay, it's three Saturdays. Uh, if anybody here uh, cannot take a quiz on Saturday because it's a Jewish Shabbat or any other uh, religious reason, uh, please let me know. Uh, I personally am Jewish, but I, I administer quizzes on, on, on Saturday and I have a deal with the guy up there and it seems to work okay. Uh, but if, if, somebody, if somebody needs to, has, has issues with that, please let me know. Okay. Um, or for any other reason, or please let us know. So the quizzes are actually just ve very short uh, types of, of elements where you kind of test your knowledge very briefly. They're short, okay? And there's no final exam, uh, but you will need to put in a lot of work on this final project, okay? And on the two homeworks. So in a sense, this is a course that requires a bit more work, I would say, a bit more time and work, but has a bit less risk. Okay, so you, in other courses, if you're also doing a pure math course, then you, well, you, you'll require a lot of work also, but, but there, there's the, probably a bit more risk with the final exam. So here, if you put in the time, things will probably work out. All right, so two assignments and a project. Um, assignment one is already online, so you can, you, you can actually go ahead and, and effectively start that. Uh, you can already start uh, assignment one. I'll answer the question in the chat in a second. And uh, assignment two, you only have a skeleton of it online. The project description is also online. So go ahead and, and study this now. So know how your uh, next four weeks, or I should actually say six weeks are looking. Uh, six weeks because a project will take you about two weeks after the course. Now the question in the chat was, uh, what time are the quizzes going to occur? Wonderful question. Um, by the way, I, I, I'll try not to say your name, so the person name, simply because this recording is going to go um, online live to the whole world. Uh, so we're, we're anonymizing uh, you. Uh, your video recordings uh, should, are not recorded, so, so this, you shouldn't be identified. Uh, so the person asked a question, thank you for that. Um, just so you know, so, and that, yeah, so all the recording links will go will go here, there'll just be YouTube links that will fill this. Uh, so if you miss a, a lecture, then you could just, uh, just go there and see the recording links. So back to the question, quizzes on Saturdays will just be open for, for the whole day. Uh, so using either Canvas or if we get that to work or alternatively some other system, maybe Gmail or something like that, you'll start the quiz, you'll then have a set time, which we believe is 45 minutes, but please don't quote me on this, it might breathe a bit. And then after that, you need to submit the quiz, okay? Okay, now there's another question. Uh, hi, I noticed that the assignments are in pairs. Were we organizing our pairs or, or were we allocating them? So not all assignments are in pairs. And I see, I see this is actually not online. So some, some assessment is in pairs and some isn't. Um, that should be on the, so we'll, we'll update this to indicate what's in pairs and what's not. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is in pairs. The first one and the second one is in. Um, now, 
no, you please find your own partner. But if you are having trouble finding a partner, please let us know and we'll help you find a partner. Okay. Using the discussion forum on Canvas should be a pretty good mechanism for that. Okay. In finding partners, it's always good to try and find somebody that actually complements your skills. If somebody feels she's a very good mathematician, but perhaps uh, not extremely code savvy, then she can find somebody that is code savvy, etc. Uh, and as I also got a direct message about having three people in a group. No, three people in a group only if the number of students is, is odd. We'll, we'll work that. So, so if, if some at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't find a pair, we'll make it work. Okay, so let's work for pairs and not, not uh, groups of three. All right, so that's the assessment. Uh, and all the assessment show Georgiana is a, is a second semester uh, honor student at the University of, of Queensland, uh, very competent. She's actually done a deep learning course uh, previously and she'll be marking all of the assessment. Any more questions about that? So that's assessment. Okay, uh, the final project, you could actually read the project description. So click this link later and read the project description. Uh, there's quite a lot there. Ask questions about it in the, in the days to come. Back to the schedule. So at this point, I think it should be rather clear. You always join the lecture on the main Zoom link. You go to the split practicals on the other links. Uh, you've got your visit hours. You've got your due dates. Um, I think we're set in terms of that. OK, now just in terms of hand in, um, there's quite a lot of hand in instructions, which you'll find here. Okay, quite a lot of hand in instructions. Um, so, two key points. Point number one single PDF, beautifully formatted, very clear. Beautifully formatted doesn't mean it has to be typed up, uh, it can be handwritten or a combination thereof, but something that's very easy and very openable uh, for the marker to read. That's one thing. Now, the other thing is this uh, method, which was, um, I, I used it personally in a course I taught last semester. So we actually expect you to attach an audio clip with your submission. So basically you, you finish your assessment, which is either a quiz or a homework assignment or the project, and then you record And here. You hold a recorder and you say, uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, John Doe. And I uh, finished uh, assignment one and uh, I found this bit difficult and this bit not difficult. Uh, I thought the assignment was fair. Well, you said it'll take me 15 hours, but it only took 12 hours or say something else of that sort. And also if that's relevant say, well, uh, and I um, did not plagiarize uh, and all the work is my own with the exception of maybe I discussed this and this with somebody else. Okay, uh, so do, this is this is a way of you uh, claiming verbally that you didn't plagiarize. But as we check the assignments, we also just play this audio clip backwards, and it actually gives a, we we find a person behind the assignment. Um, I found it to work quite well previously. So that's this audio clip, and then you've got a few more instructions here. Please just uh, just read these instructions. Any more questions? Okay, I think we're done with the fluff. Let's get to business. Um, so we're here in unit one, um, but before unit one, there's actually the, this is the main, what you'll see on the main course page. This is what you'll see. I'll go to the browser a second, just so you, you see it. This is what you'll see here on the introduction. Okay. Mathematical engineering of deep learning. Um, <coughs> So by the way, my, my lecturing style is probably gonna be in visually uh, not the most beautiful. I'm just going to scratch over these notes and add pages and scratch if needed. Um, Benoit has uh, uh, beautiful wet, uh, slides that can actually uh, give more and uh, you know, we'll, we'll each vary our style, uh, but yeah, also let us know how you feel about this all. Um, so this is the introduction to the course. Um, and okay, you've probably read this introduction um, and there are 10 study units to the course. So I'll quickly survey the 10 study units. And I should just say that what you need to do before each lecture, that is our assumption as lecturers with the exception of today is to go to the study unit and read the material. Okay, now everybody says this, read the material before the lecture, but actually our lecturing style will be under the assumption that you have spent time reading what's in the study unit prior to that. Okay, now there's a question, should we come prepared to take notes or all the information we need in these provided in the notes? 
Um, so what you can do is you can annotate in one way or another notes as you take the lecture. If, when, if we write meaningful stuff ourselves, so if we annotate meaningful stuff, we'll actually upload those notes as well. And it will also be on YouTube anyway, okay? So you don't need to take a whole bunch of notes, uh, but you just need to maximize your learning. Uh, and by this time, you probably know how to do that best for you. Yeah, so, so sh should I do some meaningful mathematics today or something like that, then I'll upload the work. Uh, upload the scribbles online, All right? Okay, so unit one, which has three hours, uh, including a practical, is just a general introduction to machine learning. Now, I must say, there are a lot of courses that teach machine learning theory from A to Z, and somewhere around W, deep learning appears, okay? So deep learning does not get the full focus, but you get full machine learning theory. We're actually not doing a machine learning theory course or theory and practice. So there's a whole bunch of things in machine learning we're not doing. We're just doing a deep learning course. You do have deep learning specific courses. Uh, some of them are quite good on the web. But as I said, many of them are, are not so mathematically focused. They're actually uh, geared to, for a more general audience. Okay, so anyway, you'll find out about general machine learning concepts here. I hope that most of the things that we do today and tomorrow in this unit one are review. Then you'll spend uh, three hours with uh, Benoit uh, speaking about logistic regression. Uh, those of you that are statisticians and even those of you that are not statistics specialists probably know about logistic regression as, a f as, as the most common generalized linear model. Uh, but logistic regression is also the very uh, specific single layer neural network, um, which will start to build stuff with. So you'll do that with Benoit. And at this point, you'll already speak about things such as loss functions and gradient descent, but then you'll spend four hours with Sharat um, going in depth onto optimization algorithms. Now, most of these optimization algorithms are actually quite simple in the sense that this is not a complicated convex optimization course or linear programming with duality and things like that, because deep learning actually uses quite simple optimization algorithms, uh, with the exception of the second order methods that you'll see in the end, uh, but you'll do that with Sharat. And then you'll spend four hours with Benoit. And this is in a sense, the most important lecture of the course or unit of the course. Uh, and that's speaking about general fully connected neural networks. So we'll build neural networks from A to Z. We'll look at the back propagate and the forward back propagation, back propagation, the training and a dropout and a batch normalization. And then all of those tricks in the trade that are used in neural networks. And that's what you'll do here, okay? And then you'll spend another uh, similar amount of time, another four hours uh, with me, with Yoni, on convolutional neural networks. Um, okay, so convolutional neural networks, this is really, in a sense, the, the pinnacle. This was a turning point uh, that happened a few years ago where people were able to use convolutional neural networks effectively, and suddenly machines could recognize images. In a, in a quite surprising way. Uh, so convolutional neural networks are in a sense specializations of general neural networks with much fewer parameters uh, structured in the right way. So we'll get in, into all that here. So that's four hours and that's four hours. So in a sense, this is, this is kind of the heart of the course, these two units. And you have a practical here and you have a practical here, right? So there's a practical here and a practical here and a practical here. Okay. Now, in, in those latter two practicals, we'll use both first principle programming. And by that, we mean that we don't use any specific package. And we'll also use packages, Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Flux. You've probably heard about deep learning packages. Um, unit six is a two hour unit where uh, Benoit will entertain you through a variety of tricks of the trade. Uh, and that's only gonna be a tip of the iceberg of what can be done, okay? So this is, some of you I know are already, so who's actually, just, just with a quick yes in the chat, who's actually trained a neural network previously, trained or used a pre-trained network? Just hit a yes there, so we just see a few yeses. There are some yeses, there are yeses, right? That's a lot of yeses. Hmm. Good, okay. And, and who hasn't? Can we see just a few no's? So can we see some proud no's? And who hasn't? Okay, there's also some no's. Good, okay. Now all we need to do is to make a binary classifier to classify the yes and the no. I don't know if I can do it based on your face or whatever. I can't see it really. Okay, so 
I, I must say that for those that have a yes, um, it might be that this course, this is not a, this is not an extremely deep, deep learning course. Okay, so it might be that we'll only kind of refine your knowledge and maybe you'll hear things from a different viewpoint and, and get a bit more. Okay, for those that are no, you'll, you'll certainly learn a whole lot here. So what I want to say here is in this tricks of the trade, when you're looking at a machine learning, deep learning professional, she or he deal with a whole bunch of tricks of the trade and you'll see a few of these with the norm. Then we go to these final three units and this is actually in the last week where um, we're dealing with, with special, specialized applications of neural networks. Uh, so the first one is again, that's two hours with me and the second one sequence models, that's two hours with the noir and then deep reinforcement learning, that's three hours with Sharad, okay? And these are, these are all, these do things in different ways. So this is for generating these uh, fake images if you'd like, but other, other things like that. Uh, sequent models are for natural language processing, etc., and deep reinforcement learning are for dynamic models. Uh, and the summary is just one hour. You'll just spend time there um, discussing the project if needed, etc. You can go ahead and read the summary as well uh, at this point. So the summary just kind of gives a bird's eye view on, on what's in deep learning. Okay. That's a whole lot of info. Uh, I think I'm taking a bit of time, but that's okay. We're, we're getting just to, to cover it all. Um, now, you, you've got a few resources just, just so we know this. So the GitHub repo, this GitHub repo uh, has stuff that's mostly Julia stuff. Okay, so if you're not planning to use Julia directly, uh, then ignore this. Uh, Google Collab, so you'll just find hyperlinks to Google Collab. These are Python uh, notebooks. And you'll also have links to a few uh, additional R uh, pages. Okay. All right, now about words. So I actually don't wanna spend time defining things. And if you haven't read this yet, then go ahead and read this after the lecture. Um, but you know, there's, there's a phrase deep learning and the phrase machine learning. Uh, and you know, for some people, deep learning is a subset of machine learning where other people, sometimes you'll, you'll see actually deep learning and machine learning, what's better. Uh, there's also statistics obviously and data science and artificial intelligence and all these phrases. So we kind of try to make sense of this here. Um, so just go, go ahead and read that. Um, and you can also look at, uh, at these two videos uh, which are either quite long. So I actually recommend when I say, look, it's good enough to listen. So you can go and do your daily exercise or your daily gardening chores or whatever, and listen to these two videos. Uh, and they actually say a whole bunch of things about the state of the art of uh, deep learning and the future, et cetera, et cetera. So this course is opposed to many deep learning courses that does not take a historical chronological perspective. So you, you, you have many courses where people kind of build and they start with a perceptron and they go in 1958 and then they move on. And then there was something called AI winter, et cetera. Uh, we just want to get to the math mathematical engineering of deep learning and tell you how it is. Having said all that, I must say that if you go to the references uh, page, then it's probably worth to take a look <coughs> at this first category of papers, which we call the key papers in development of deep learning. So this is about uh, just about a dozen papers starting in 1958 and, and the last one in 2017 of, of points which were really kind of uh, fundamental points where there were revolutionary uh, steps, okay? And between them, there were many evolutionary steps. Okay, so you'll find that in the references. Uh, this references page, if I'm here, I might as well also say that this category, further deep learning papers, this category is important because your papers for the project or your final project will involve one of those papers and you'll choose one of these papers. We'll probably add a, uh, one or two more. And if you find one, that, and if there's one that you're interested in not here, you, you can tell us also. Okay, so these are kind of also important papers, but not as milestone-ish as these. All right, let me go back to the intro. Um, so that's that. Um, now, other courses of deep learning will spend about uh, 15 minutes speaking about the brain, something that I actually know uh, very little about. Um, 
And actually, humanity doesn't know a whole lot about, but there's a whole bunch of people uh, studying it, and it's it's a, it's a wonderful frontier for the 21st century, maybe for the 22nd century. Um, that's under the optimistic assumption that we don't destroy uh, ourselves prior. Is anybody here a neuroscientist of sort by any chance? Just just so we know. No, no, no neuroscientists is already. Oh yes, we've got a neuroscientist, uh, two, a pair of. Okay, wonderful. Um, so that'd be nice to hear more from you later on, but but that's good. Uh, so of course, there was a whole lot of hype of deep neural networks, neural neuron, etc., and just neural networks motivated by um, by neurons in the brain. Um, but we're not going to say uh, much more about that because for us, a deep neural network is actually a a linear mapping with some non-linearities with more linear maps and more non-linearities and linear, more, more non-linearities, et cetera. Um, I must say that since I got into this field, which is about two years ago and started to kind of be interested, when I look at my own tasks and the tasks that my kids perform, I do think of, oh, well, we are in a sense machines and how, how we kind of work. But the analogy breaks quite quickly. Um, we should also speak about uh, very briefly about this thing called uh, GAI, general artificial intelligence um, so this is as far as most people agree this is a frontier that has still not been reached okay uh, general artificial intelligence is having a machine that is human-like uh, that can maybe uh, prove a theorem in a general way or understand something that it never understood before so really creating uh, intelligence which is human-like or surpasses human level uh, all the successes to date have been on things that are very task specific with a whole bunch of compute thrown into it. Uh, most people in deep learning actually believe that this is an attainable goal. Um, however, we must keep in mind that the mathematical technology that we'll be speaking about in the next four weeks is 40 years old, okay? Um, you, you have in parallel now, uh, extremely sophisticated um, AMSI summer school courses dealing with permutations and string, string theory and, and all kinds of things in, in pure math that are very advanced. We're actually using mathematics that's, that's old, that's been known actually for hundreds of years, uh, or at least 200, and well, from Newton 350, et cetera, uh, and is not so deep in that sense. So maybe to achieve this, something else is needed, but that's not clear, and I'm, and I'm certainly not the person to, um, to predict that. Um, now, two other ingredients that are actually as important, if not more important than the mathematics, uh, that have really uh, taken apart in the deep learning revolution are compute power. Okay, so computers have been becoming faster and faster and faster. And this was an evolutionary process uh, with, with a lot of, of intermediate steps, okay? And, and a lot of smart mathematics in there, but it just has to do with, with making computers more efficient, with making the VLSI chip design better, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the other one is data. Data storage has just become uh, extremely cheap. So we actually have a whole lot of data. Uh, so these are, you know, if the third pillar is a mathematics and that's our focus, let's not lose, uh, let's, not respect the, let's not stop respecting these two things, compute power and data. Okay, now you actually have here, I'm just jumping between the uh, notability where I can scratch in the videos. You actually have these two videos, which I suggest watching. So if you really know what a GPU is, certainly if you trained a neural network with a GPU, don't worry about this first video. Uh, but if you don't know what a GPU is, uh, at least to get a feel for what it is and watch the short video. Uh, and this second video uh, just speaks about uh, ImageNet which was uh, a collection of images uh, collected uh, now just a bit more than a decade ago that really sparked uh, or took a central, made it was a central part of the deep learning revolution because it allowed people to actually train convolutional deep neural networks on images. Uh, so I recommend watching these two. All right, now we move to um, the key activities of machine learning. Okay, and this is in a very uh, general sense. So what, what, what I mean by the activities, if you think of what are the key activities of, for example, a statistician? Well, a statistician, maybe she does exploratory data analysis, she does data cleaning, she does imputation, she does inference, which maybe involves point estimation and a post test and confidence intervals and stuff like that. What does a machine learner do? Okay, 
Uh, so one key activity, which will be our main focus is called supervised learning. Okay, that's a phrase. Uh, many of you probably have heard about this phrase and if you haven't, then here you go, now you do. So now you're hearing about it. So in supervised learning, your data involves pairs X, I and Y, I. Y is typically very low dimensional, just a scalar or even a label, maybe just a categorical thing. And X is typically very high dimensional, like an image or a movie or something like that, okay? And what we wanna do is we want to learn to predict Y based on X, okay? Just like regression, all right? It's only that in supervised learning, we, we think about two uh, general cases. One is called regression and one is called classification in classification, the labels, the YI, the labels, okay? What you'd call as a statistician, the response variable, the labels are from often from a finite set, a small finite set, and in regression problem, there may be a continuous variable, okay? All right, so that's supervised learning. This is where most of the course is, all right? This is where we were spending most of our time. Unsupervised learning is a case where we only have an X, okay? There are no labels. Uh, if you think of how a baby learns, uh, babies learn in, in very complex ways, but they know nobody, you know, she doesn't pop out of um, the tummy and then says, oh, tell me this, am I right or am I wrong, right? There's just exploration and through this exploration, uh, there's learning about X. That's unsupervised learning. We're spending very little time on unsupervised learning, okay? Sometimes unsupervised learning tasks such as the two main common basic tasks of classification and data reduction take part of in the greater scheme of, uh, of deep learning because sometimes we're condensing our data and doing stuff like that. We'll probably see things about that. Uh, probably Benoit will speak to you more about this one in unit six around tricks of the trade. Now, <coughs> a third task is slightly different and that's grown to become reinforcement learning uh, and we're spending three hours with that uh, with Sharat in unit nine. So reinforcement learning, uh, for those of you that come from operations research, et cetera, is like Markov decision processes or dynamic programming, dynamic programming. So the concept of time is central, okay? And an agent exists and gets inputs and make decisions, okay? So it's not like the, this setting, which is static, where you train something and then you use it, but you're actually maybe programming a robot or a self-driving car or something like that, okay? Uh, a huge success has been the AlphaGo success, which many of you probably heard about. That's kind of uh, from a few years back, all right? So that's reinforcement learning. Now, a fourth task that we'll spend uh, time on is generative modeling. This is sometimes considered to be a, a type of unsupervised learning, okay? But we put it here as something else. So in generative modeling, what we're actually doing is we're taking data X and we're learning how to generate data that looks like X, okay? In a very naive way, we can just do model fitting by doing kernel density estimation or something like that. But uh, generative modeling in the general sense is uh, what we'll speak about here is generative adversarial networks, okay? These uh, were invented back in 2014 and since then uh, have gone long ways, okay? So each of these activities can be carried out with deep learning uh, or without, our focus will be under deep learning, okay? Any questions about this introduction? Okay. And I see in the chat that in addition to uh, two neuroscientists, we have a brain, brain cancer scientist. Uh, so that's also great. Um, thanks for joining. All right, so let's go to unit one. And so in the 11 minutes that we have left, I'll, I'll start to overview this unit one. And then uh, for tomorrow, we'll have 50 more minutes before we go to the practical. And uh, I'd expect you to finish reading through this, this unit one, uh, and then I'll, I'll highlight certain things, okay? So uh, our lessons, by the way, we'll, we'll, our meetings every hour is actually 50 minutes, okay? 10 minutes are afterwards for coffee or tea or chat or answering questions or moving to the next class. So that's it. 
All right, so the purpose of this unit is just to uh, speak about supervised learning uh, in general, uh, get, a, get a bit of groundwork before we move on to unit two and you start to do um, um, uh, logistic regression as the basic neural network with Benoit. So a sea of data. Obviously we're speaking about many, 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 many different data forms. Uh, but in general, in the most basic way, you could think of a data point as a vector, as a vector X, okay? And you know, the length will be D, maybe we'll change notation in different chapters. We're not fully consistent with notation throughout, but we'll, we'll try to be, okay? And um, so then each coordinate is coordinate X1 through XD, okay? Now D is typically very high dimensional, okay? So, you know, if it's an image, it's gonna be, you know, uh, 10,000. Right, or something like that, or much bigger, all right? Now, your collection of data points, you can put them in a matrix if you'd like, and that will be this matrix capital X, and you know, be the vector X1, X2, X superscript three, X up to X superscript N, that's the nth data point, okay? That's one way to represent things. Um, you can also represent the transpose of this, and that's the more standard way when you have, like if you think of an Excel table, you have features or a data frame and observations, okay? So, so here you have, this is the first, I'm gonna now put this as the first vector X here. That's the first vector, that's a vector, let me write it. That's a vector X superscript one up to the vector X superscript N, okay? Right, so you can organize things in both ways. And one of the first things you need to do when you work with data and think, is think of how you organize them. Okay, that's in general, that's your, that's your data X. Now, typically with the data X, you also have a label Y. So for each X, which can be very high dimensional, you also have a label Y. So you'll have here, you know, Y1, Y2, up to YN, for example. Now, data is not always finite dimensional. Okay, um, in unit eight, when you deal with Benoit with sequence models and a data can just be a sequence of variable length. Okay, you can always say, well, take sequences of variable length and just cap them at the maximal length, but sometimes it's not the natural thing. Uh, so if you look at text, for example, text is natural to consider as a sequence of variable length or even a movie if you'd like. Okay, just some forms that the data point uh, X can take, and I won't spend time on each of these, but here's, here's one very specific form. If you just think of a voice recording, then one of the most natural ways to record a voice recording is every short time interval to record the amplitude of the voice, okay? Relative to some baseline. Uh, for example, standard voice recordings are at 8,000 uh, um, samples per second. So that means that every 1.25 uh, microseconds, we have kind of a voice sample. Okay, so this is, this would be, you know, so th this is just to get a feel for it. So, you know, a, if we say something for exactly five seconds, then the dimension is going to be 40,000. Okay, that's going to be a fixed voice recording. Again, for voice recordings, maybe looking at a sequence, this type of thing, as opposed to a fixed vector is better, uh, but still that's a voice recording. Um, a monochrome image. So we'll deal with that a whole lot. That's actually gonna be monochrome images and color images will be our focus, uh, okay? So a monochrome image, of course, you can you can think of the image, you're, you're gonna say, well, by monochrome, I mean black and white, but I'm not saying black and white because maybe we're just um, plotting it in orange scale, okay? But every pixel of the image just has an intensity and that intensity can be the lowest intensity or highest intensity, et cetera, okay? So um, common data set we'll use, the MNIST data set of, on which there's more below is 28 by 28 pixels. So that means there are 784, that's 28 times 28 pixels, okay? And if you wanna represent this X as a vector, well, of course you can go maybe this way, that's like column major, you know, you can go like down like this, so vectorize it this way, or maybe you can go this way and that would be a different way to do it, okay? And these are kind of, this is how you would do that. That's not so interesting what's here, okay? So that's mapping from the image to the vector. 
Okay. If you're speaking about a color image, then the standard way to represent the color image is with red, green, and blue. So then you'd have your green layer and your red layer and your blue layer. Okay. And when you put these layers together, you see a color image. Now, of course, when we store images and when we send them to each other, et cetera, what we're not, we're, not, we're in no way sending to each other bitmaps, pixel by pixel, because that would be too wasteful. There are all these compression formats that store images in a much better way. But actually for purposes of deep learning, we convert it from those advanced formats like the JPEG format or the GIF format or even the PNG format. PNG also compresses, but is lossless, okay? But from all the, we, we convert it into a bitmap image, okay? So when you think of it this way, this thing is actually a tensor, okay? So it's a three tensor, okay? So you've got this dimension, you've got this dimension, you've got this dimension. The three is not because we've got three colors, the three is because we've got three dimensions, okay? It's a three tensor. Uh, and of course, we'd also vectorize uh, this sometimes in one way or another, okay? Of course, if you've got a silent color movie, then what you've got is many of these one after the other. Now you might get a sequence model, and this is probably advances in deep learning in the next decade are gonna be in, in terms of kind of, because there's stronger compute and things are more effective, there'll be sequence models for movies. There's still not great deep learning of kind of looking at a whole movie and knowing what's happen, happening, okay? It's just a data volume is huge. Uh, but you can also, if you if you put it off of fixed and finite size, you can see you can you can read this just to get kind of an indication for the size of the data. Okay, so that's kind of image data. All right, um, a text corpus. All right, so if you if you look at text, the natural way to represent text in the olden days is based on ASCII code. ASCII code, you for each character you've got uh, one byte. Okay, so you've got a character for A and a character for capital A and for character for exclamation mark, etc. More commonly today, Unicode. Unicode is kind of the modern day ASCII. You've got uh, two bytes for each character and you can do all the languages and you can even do variable things with that, okay? Uh, but the main point is that text is kind of a sequence of characters, okay? We're not gonna deal a whole lot with text in this course, uh, but a lot of great advances of the past two or three years are around text, okay? One of the things you might do with text is actually convert it into a vector in a very, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that kind of loses a lot of the information, but still keeps uh, some of the information. So what you'll do is you'll do a word frequency histogram, okay? So you can take the 40,000 words in the English dictionary, say zero to uh, 40,000, okay? Or something like that, okay? And you just take your text and you say, oh, the word written, okay, let's throw it here. The word means, let's throw it here. And you build this histogram. The word and, let's do it here. So you've got this histogram of like, the appearance of the words. Of course, it's going to be a very sparse vector because, you know, my vocabulary, for example, I just use like 50 words, maybe 100. I probably use 500 words, okay? Uh, but, you know, you don't, it's going to be a sparse vector and it will just say the frequency of the words, but you're going to lose all the spatial component. But some stuff can be done on that, okay? That's, that's one way of representing a text corpus in a lossy way. Uh, and finally, there are heterogeneous data sets. So I'll just go back to this, uh, this thing here when we spoke about kind of an Excel spreadsheet, right? Um, there are 68 of you. Um, and uh, Benoit and Charlotte and me, we got an Excel spreadsheet that uh, presented a heterogeneous data set where, you know, we had your name and uh, gender and affiliation and study, et cetera, right? So the vector X contains heterogeneous data. Okay, that's it. Um, so I'll just speak briefly about this popular example data sets and then actually get you going for the practical for tomorrow, just so you come to prepared. And tomorrow we'll, we'll pick up from here onwards. Okay, uh, so I recommend watching this video. I just put you on the website so you see this video. It, it's just that the screenshot for me to scratch on does not capture the video. Uh, so this uh, nice YouTuber, she's a PhD student in MIT. Uh, I, I like her videos. Um, so that's, that's, that's a pretty good video that just kind of explains uh, about popular data sets. Now, when we're speaking about popular data sets, what do we use them for? Well, we use them for courses such as this, okay, to learn about 
how machine learning, deep learning works. But people actually also use the data sets for professional reasons, because sometimes you can use kind of this data set that's generic, like one of these guys to train a neural network and then do something called transfer learning to augment it for your specific data set where you don't have so much data. Okay, just so you know. So, so these kind of standardized data sets are here for kind of two reasons, one for practice, but also for, also not for practice, also for the real stuff. Uh, we'll be using the following data sets really for the exercise in this course. Uh, we will not, I'll say what we will not be using, we will not be using ImageNet. Has anybody uh, trained anything with ImageNet ever uh, from the ones that have said yes before? <coughs> no, 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 I don't see a yes here. So the ImageNet data set is this massive, beautiful data set that has uh, 15 million labeled images that's really advanced things forward. However, to train stuff with ImageNet, uh, we need quite a lot of compute power and quite a lot of processing time. And th there's, there's a lot to be learned from that, but that's not something we will be using directly for, for the course. We'll be using smaller data sets. So we'll be using the MNIST data set, which is the, oops, sorry, the 28 by 28 uh, images. Okay, so the MNIST data set. We'll be using the fashion MNIST dataset, which just, just looks like MNIST, but is uh, not images of digits, but images of fashion. Um, not too glamorous, I must say. And we'll be using the SciFAR 10 dataset. So actually in tomorrow's practical, you'll, you'll work on all three. Okay, so you'll already work on all three. And that should probably give enough to do quite a lot for the... Uh, for the two assignments that we have. Maybe for your project, you'll choose to use something else in addition or a data set that's, that's not here. Okay, so my time is pretty much up. Uh, I'll answer this question in a second, but for tomorrow, this is what I'm asking you to do. So tomorrow we're meeting for two hours. The first hour is again, me blabbering and uh, hopefully you uh, cutting me with some questions. So please read all of this from the MNIST data set downwards. Okay, um, you, you don't need to follow every line of code, obviously, uh, but watch the videos if you need. In general, we're pasting in videos on things that are tangential to the course, okay? So the videos that we've pasted are for things that, you know, are for you nice to know, but are not the central theme of the course. So there's a video on PCA, principal component analysis, and a video on K-means, uh, not central to the course, but if you haven't dealt with these things and good to know. So, so read all this, please. Uh, there's a short video on this example, something called Safe Blues that Chart and me are involved with. Um, and we'll, we'll cover all this in the one hour tomorrow briefly. Okay. Then in the second hour tomorrow, just to be clear, we're going to split up. And uh, I'll remind this, of course, at the end of the first hour. Um, but in the second hour, you'll choose if you are an R person, a Python person, or a Julia person, um, you don't have to tattoo this into your skin, you just, just for tomorrow, okay? Or maybe for the course, all right? And then you'll go and join Benoit, Sharat, or uh, me respectively. There's a question, I mainly use MATLAB and I'm doing mathematics. Uh, do you have any suggestion of which one are Python Julia to use? Okay, so, I mean, of course I'm very biased here, so I, I should just make sure that Benoit and Shard don't jump on me. Look, Julia is a modern programming language uh, and the other two are not, but Julia has, is much less popular. If your goal is to get a job uh, in industry in the next uh, year or two, uh, then probably knowing Python and R uh, is, is better. Uh, if because you, you want to kind of hit the ground rolling. Uh, however, Julia has been branded by, by many people doing machine learning as a, as a language of the next decade, the next two decades. So the, the reason is, is that it, you can code a native Julia and um, run very fast. So it's both easy to use and runs fast, but it has its growing pains, okay? Uh, Julia feel, uh, the, the MATLAB and Julia, MATLAB is closest to Julia uh, and farthest from R, okay? Uh, installing Julia is a bit harder, just marginally harder, and uh, getting help online is also a bit harder because you just have such vast help for R, which has dominated the world of statistics for uh, more than two decades, and Python, which is really the language of machine learning to date. 
Um, there's another question. Compression algorithms possibly meaningful structure of images, videos effectively compress them. If data volumes are a challenge in vision test, do you know if there's work on learning directly with compressed? Yes, there is work. I've never spent time di di delving into this work. Okay, so um, yeah, there'll be, there'll be plenty of papers of people learning from directly the compressed features and uh, not from the... Um, but then, then your convolutional neural networks don't work. So convolutional neural networks are all about spatial dependence. So keep that question, uh, the person asked, I keep that when we speak about convolutions in a, in a few weeks. Um, okay, so just the last thing for tomorrow's lecture, please before have your platform running. So go to this link, go to this. So what you would do, you'd, you'd for example, click here SM. So I've clicked SM and this goes to Google Colab. And that will be, you don't have to read all of the content for the, of the practical, but you want to kind of see that, uh, that you can get lines to run. Okay. So this is a practical that, that chart will be running. Okay. Um, and similarly, there are links for uh, the R practical with Benoit and the Julia practical with me. Any final questions before we go off to our reading? Okay then, so see you tomorrow at the scheduled time. Oh, one, one more question. No, there's no dumb questions, by the way. Uh, I'll, I'll give plenty of dumb answers, uh, no dumb questions. Uh, might be a bit of a, no, no dumb question. Just in terms of pair programming for assignment, are we expected to find a partner who is competent in the same programming language? Great question, not a dumb question at all. Yes, so when you do an assignment, you're probably, I mean, you can, you can, you can hand in things with multiple um, languages. Okay. But it's, un unless, unless you're, you're kind of, unless you feel very comfortable, it's probably best to just stay in one language. So, and hence it's good to find a partner in this that uses the same language or convince her or him. And there's another question. Uh, are you expected to attend all lectures? Um, in, it's recommended you're not expected to. There is something with the summer school regulations, I'm not so sure, and we're actually supposed to give them an attendance report, which we'll do based on Zoom. So if you're doing the course for credit, I think there might be maybe some minimal number, but I'm not so sure. Please try to attend. If you can't, watch it on YouTube. There's another question. It's great you're coming with the questions. It's good. How far ahead can we try to read before the notes might not be ready? Perfect question. So the notes are ready. And by the way, ready is at note level. This is not a professional book in, in, in any way, shape or form, okay? The notes are ready up to uh, four, up to uh, unit four. So from unit five onwards, you'll see this unit is still under construction. There's stuff there, but we're, we're still developing it, okay? Yeah, I, I want to add a, a comment on uh, chapter three of yeah, my, sure, sure. I'm adding, examples for illustration that's the only thing but uh, they can very well read it uh, without any difficulty in the theory part mm -hmm. uh, i'm just adding python code and some examples and that should not be a difficult thing uh, yeah perfect okay yeah so as, as Shara just said so he's still updating some bits of chapter three but but go ahead and you know if if you feel you you want to manage your time differently you can run forward if you have spare time what what i do suggest is actually I mean, already the, the, the asking you to read something for tomorrow is already quite a lot. But one thing you can do is already spend time reading, thinking about your final project. I know it's far, but read the final project and then look at the papers associated with the final project. Okay, more question. Um, um, there's a question, somebody missed the lecture. Um, I can't, well, okay, so all times here are in the, if you miss the lecture, it'll be recorded, but all times here are in in the uh, Sydney time, okay? So South Australia and uh, Northern Territory people, you guys like to live like a half hour difference from the rest of the world. Um, I don't know, go and do some riots about that. Uni? Uh, yeah. Uni? Yes. Uh, could you just uh, click on the on my link on the split practical just to be sure? Yeah. Because there are one HTML file and the VL just All to right. show the people and the other is the R script. Perfect. Can okay. Click to show. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No problem. Thanks, Benoit. So that that was Benoit Lequin. Okay. So. Um,
for the R, for those of you doing R, for those of you choosing to use R to more on the practical, you've got this page, which is an HTML page. So this is not runnable code. This is code you can copy paste into R Studio. Okay, but it's not runnable code. So that's that's accessible from hitting this BL here. It takes a while to load because it has a, uh, the last thing you're doing in tomorrow's assessment is creating this uh, exciting movie. Okay. <laughs> All right. So so that's why it's it, it takes a while to load because it's one HTML file. You also have the R source, uh, which takes you to GitHub and gets the R source. Okay. So if you're using R, you've got both of these sources for tomorrow. And if you're using Julia, then uh, click the YN and you just get to the Julia. So that's tomorrow's. Tomorrow's practical is basically to get you running on using the data sets without too much theory. Any more? Do you need to find a part? I think that's it. Okay, very exciting, everybody. So uh, see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Sydney time and the relevant time in your time. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Thanks Jenny.